DLC seems like a pretty difficult thing to get right. There's a lot that can go wrong, and a lot of ways people can feel cheated or disappointed. Sometimes DLC feels more like an excuse to make people pay above full price to get the completed game they thought they were going to pay for the first time. It seems almost as hard, or maybe even harder, to write a good prequel. Even in the most popular franchises of all time, designing a prequel clearly has some level of pitfalls that often result in less beloved entries that, if they're lucky, have some cool things that they add to the universe they take place in. The first things I think of when you say prequel are the Star Wars prequels and the Hobbit trilogy. The former of which has been, uh, let's say thoroughly critiqued in every single way. I don't like sand. And the latter of which I enjoy a lot, but I can't deny that I think the Lord of the Rings is just an all around better crafted trilogy. Clearly, there's a difficult set of hurdles to overcome when taking on the development of DLC or a prequel. So you can imagine my surprise that Monolith Soft's DLC prequel to one of my favorite stories ended up being kind of sort of the best example of both things I've ever seen. And that's a surreal thing for me to be saying because I was pretty lukewarm on Torna on my first playthrough. I'd heard it be praised for having an equally compelling cast of characters and story to the base game. When I finished it though, I ended up kind of disappointed. It certainly wasn't a bad game by any stretch, but relative to Xenoblade 2's base game, I found it to be far less emotionally gripping, and I really only enjoyed seeing the characters I already knew from the base game, Jin, Mithra, and Malos especially, with characters like Laura and Adam being disappointing to me. It still contained the core Xenoblade 2 gameplay that I loved, but relative to what I'd seen many other people saying, I was far less impressed, and I didn't really have the slightest idea what about the cast was as compelling as the one in the base game to people. I still think the base game is unquestionably my preferred experience between the two, but I think what ultimately made me so much more negative towards Torna was that I did what it sounds like many had done to Xenoblade X before. I went into this game looking for it to be as long and fleshed out and complex an experience as the base game was, and I ended up coming out on the other side disappointed that the game wasn't something it was never trying to be. This game wasn't interested in being an experience as massive and complex as Xenoblade 2 was, it couldn't have been given how soon it released after the base game, and that's perfectly okay. I think the biggest reason Torna didn't gel with me wasn't even because of the game itself, but just the conversation surrounding it. It's no secret that Xenoblade 2 is like pretty easily the most divisive game in the Xenoblade series, and it is the source of a lot of debate within the fandom. Obviously, disliking the game or daring to disagree with me isn't a problem at all, but all I mean to say is that sometimes the amount of pure hatred thrown at Xenoblade 2 can be really exhausting to see and endure as somebody who wholeheartedly loves the game. In fact, that was part of the reason I felt so inclined to make the Xenoblade 2 video as long as it was. I really wanted to provide a thorough explanation of why that game is, and hopefully always will be, one of my favorite games. This level of vitriol is not something I've seen at all with the conversations surrounding Torna. Part of that resentment for all the negativity thrown at Xenoblade 2 ended up making me react in a manner no less childish than those aforementioned avid detractors in hindsight. It was one of those things where it made me passive aggressively ask, well what's so great about Torna that wasn't great about Xenoblade 2? I kind of resented Torna because it was so seemingly unanimously welcomed by the entire Xenoblade fandom. But once I let the dust settle, after I distanced myself from all that nonsense, I just sat down and played it again before finishing the Xenoblade 2 video for the sake of getting footage, and I really liked it. I still have notable problems with it, but it was at that point that I realized several crucial things about the way I play these games and why I love all of them so much. If the length of the video hasn't clued you in, there will be spoilers for Xenoblade Chronicles 1, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and their respective expansions. The way I think about all of these games basically necessitates that I spoil them, so I recommend you beat all of these games before watching. In terms of which games to play first, I recommend beating Xenoblade 1 and then going to base game 2 and then Torna. Despite Torna taking place before base game 2, I think it's easier to find more to appreciate about Torna after playing the base game. I think the main party in Torna will connect to you better if you played the base game first when you realize their importance in the fate of all rest 500 years in the future. There are also major chunks of world building that aren't really explained in Torna, for example the way blades are bonded, how blades and drivers utilize each other's energy, and who the architect is and what he's done for all rest thus far. I don't think that would break any of what Torna's story goes into, but I think the base game was meant to be experienced before Torna myself. A portion of Torna's story was supposedly meant to be told between chapters 7 and 8 of the base game, but I don't think you'd have a bad time playing Torna first if that's what you want to do. Torna is absolutely worth the money if you played it and enjoyed the base game, and $30 for it as well as a sweet lineup of base game perks and additions is absolutely great value for the money. As much as the game may appear to be Xenoblade 2's assets thrown into another campaign, trust me when I say that it achieves something far more than what you would expect. With all the introductory stuff out of the way, Let's talk about the greatest piece of DLC I've ever experienced. Everybody kick back, relax, and get yourselves a snack and a beverage because this is a dive into Torna the Golden Country.
If one wishes to thoroughly enjoy Torna, it's important to take the time to look around and smell the roses, so to speak. The key thing that kept me from loving Torna as much as I could have on the first shake is that I wanted to get through it quickly. I had just spent 150 hours doing all that I could in the base game and I just wanted to experience Torna's story and then move on. This is not a mindset I think anyone should go into any Xenoblade game with, not even the shorter expansions. You're meant to go about it, not slowly, but if you're looking to go into these games and blast through them as fast as possible, it's not going to be a good time, or at least not from my own experience. Even the New Game Plus run I did of Xenoblade 2 where I skipped most of the cutscenes was way less gripping to me than the playthrough I did just days before where I got near 100%. These games are best enjoyed at a leisurely pace in my experience, taking the time to explore every area as much as I see fit, fighting optional enemies, and looking around at the beautiful vistas is what makes the story content so meaningful. When I'm just trying my best to sprint through every area as fast as possible, these games don't work for me. Torna is probably the best illustration of why you should take your time if you want to enjoy these games. You've really got to take the time to explore all rest and everything in it. I hate how much my first playthrough of Torna had to suffer because of my own impatience, but suffice it to say, I won't let that happen with any future Xenoblade game. It really is a shame that I wanted to speed through the game so quickly, because the ability to immerse yourself in the world of Allrest is made even easier than it was in the base game thanks to Torna's numerous quality of life adjustments. If Xenoblade 2 ever gets re-released, I hope a majority of these changes can be added to the base game in some form. Tutorials are re-readable and actually come at you in a logical and digestible way? What? <laughs> Imagine that! <laughs> All collection points are labeled by what items you'll find from interacting with them. You can switch between drivers and blades without pausing. You can now see unique monster tombstones on the quick travel map. And I'm sure there are even more subtle ones that I'm forgetting even still. The quality of life features themselves aren't even the only thing Monolith added to illustrate how good they are at listening to criticism. The intro, for example, is much easier to digest early on this time around, and is paced pretty well too for repeat playthroughs. I like Xenoblade 2's intro, but it's certainly not a compelling start on the gameplay side of things. Torna isn't amazing on that end, but it is much better. Combat still certainly isn't anything to write home about at first, but you're immediately started in a condensed area to explore with enemies to fight and mechanics to grow accustomed to. You're already getting a good taste of what Xenoblade is all about in this introduction, and that's fantastic. You get most of your full party pretty quickly. About 3 hours into my recent playthrough, I already had everyone but Minoth, who's a fairly nice surprise addition I didn't see coming. As a result of this, battling pretty much instantly begins at a quick pace, and it's much to the game's benefit. And this is where we begin to see the significant adjustments made to the combat. Several of these adjustments I don't even think were necessary, but end up working for Torna really well. Talon Arts make a return, and they've been reworked into more of a spammable risk-reward option for the drivers while being more situationally helpful for the blades. Laura's Talon Art, for example, sacrifices HP to instantly recharge all of her arts, which is quite helpful seeing as she has the most reliable break art in the party. Adam's Talon Art, meanwhile, sacrifices HP to extend driver combo duration so as to allow for greater damage output. Hayes gets something of an inverse of Laura's Talon Art where she sacrifices her recharged arts to stop enemies. Mithra's Talon Art functions as a buffer to help the party get themselves together if she faints mid-battle by allowing the party to evade numerous attacks and so on. Controlling your blades directly wasn't something I even really wanted in the base game, but in Torna it's a really solid addition. The flow of combat is fundamentally changed from Xenoblade 2's combat, and it really helps distinguish Torna's style in the best way possible. It helps illustrate on a gameplay level how influential Jin and Laura's coordinated fighting style became in Allrest, and why the Blades and Drivers 500 years later are this coordinated from the start. In your fight with Adam and Mithra, it was absolutely no accident that the two of them are treated as completely separate enemies. The Drivers and Blades in Torna act pretty independently, while in the future, Rex and Pyra immediately begin passing the weapon to each other, and that's some insanely cool attention to detail that the dev team put in. Vanguard switching is a pretty substantial addition that's incentivized pretty damn well. Anytime you see red HP, you can recover it by switching, giving a more defensive incentive to avoid staying on one character for the whole battle, which in turn gives the player a taste of the variety of combat styles each character has. Each blade and driver gets a driver combo effect by switching, creating a greater offensive incentive to switch often. Like the base game, all of your arts recharge much faster when you switch often. Unlike the base game, however, you cannot purchase pouch items, so art recharge isn't an effect that you can rely on very much anymore and the combat was properly adjusted so that this isn't even close to a problem. The unique animations every character gets when vanguard switching also adds another layer of cool factor and satisfaction when landing one of these. As usual, the animations for every character are absolutely wonderful, both in and out of battle. Look at Mithra's vanguard switch animation, for example, or basically any of her battle animations. There's a general sense of impatience to her attack style. She just frantically flails her sword around during some of her specials as if to say, JUST DIE ALREADY! Aegean fights like a ninja, frequently flipping around, quickly stabbing and evading with intense precision and rhythm. 
Minoth has a uniquely cool flair about him. His specials and arts are so much fun to nail the timing on because of his animations. He's almost dancing during some of them, and it creates a stark contrast to 500 years later when he can barely move at all. How can you not have fun playing this game when you're playing as a ponytailed cowboy looking ballet dancer shooting energy beams at a giant snake? Come on. Another substantial change to combat is the way blade combos and elemental orbs work. Blade combos can now progress by using any special so long as it's the appropriate level, and elemental orbs are now rewarded after you use a special like the common blade ability Orb Master in the main game. Both editions are ones that I think work perfectly for Torna and its own combat, but I wouldn't want them to stick around for a future game if we happen to use a similar system. Sure, these changes do speed up combat a noticeable bit, but I also find it takes a lot of the team strategy and resulting intrinsic reward away from what was possible in the base game. In Torna, you don't customize your party very much at all. The only thing you really get to tailor is the equipment, aux cores, and the driver's weapon element, which even then doesn't really matter considering you most definitely want at least one of each element on your team for chain attacking. This is the case for the base game as well, but in the base game, to me, it's significantly more satisfying to synergize your party around all of the elements because in order to get the most elemental utility out of your party, you're aiming to complete 8 blade combos, which is not easy. You can also transform any party member to fit whatever role you want them to. And when you're given so many possible team building options, it gives you the sense that having all of the elements accounted for is a real accomplishment. In Torna, you use every single party member no matter what, and you can't make a vastly different version of Adam or Laura or Hugo. Their role is basically set in stone once you get them. As a result of said customization limitations, it doesn't really feel as rewarding to get a full burst or a huge collection of orbs on the bosses considering you can just kind of crap out whatever blade combo you feel like and you have little punishment for it. The only real exceptions I can think of are that many of the unique monsters have elemental awakening, which is a mostly welcome change. The awakening status lets enemies do more damage, recharges their arts faster, and your blade combo duration is made much shorter. It encourages you to not over rely on blade combos and orbs, and incentivizes a more offensive style of play when it comes to using chain attacks. Once the elemental orbs are gone, the awakening status goes with it, so you may as well use the party gauge to do more damage and weaken the enemy. Another notable punishment for special spamming is the second to last optional super boss who recovers HP whenever you get an orb on them, which is a unique challenge but more or less just means that the fight's gonna take longer just for the sake of it. I want to clarify that all of this is perfectly fine, and I believe Torna was clearly built with these limitations in mind. The reason I'm going to these lengths to clarify this is to acknowledge why this combat system works for Torna specifically, and I believe there would need to be a lot of significant changes made to refine it for a full length game. Your progression of combat abilities is handled much better than it was in the base game for sure. And the only hang up I have there is that I wish they went the Xenoid 1 route and unlocked chain attacks as soon as possible or once you got Hugo instead of barring you off from until Minoth joins in. Otherwise, the ability to reread the tutorials so you actually get an in-game verification you're playing correctly is much appreciated. And is also a change I cannot fucking believe didn't get patched into the base game. The level scaling and ability to overkill for more experience is equally excellent to how it was in the base game. Even the minor complaints I have about the minimal customization don't really bother me at all considering the returning affinity chart system helps give you little achievements throughout each area that a need for a more substantial customization isn't really there, and the game ends exactly when it feels like the combat's begun to stagnate. I'd say the biggest problem I have with the combat is that leveling your rearguard arts is the closest thing I can think of to a stat that's basically useless to level up in a Xenoblade game. I absolutely despise when RPGs have a stat that's useless to level up. It's possibly the greatest middle finger to your time and energy to realize that you've been tricked into the game into upgrading a stat that doesn't matter at all. And this is the closest I've seen to this in any of the games I've played thus far. Upgrading these isn't useless, but it is way more effective to focus on Vanguard arts, and wouldn't you know it, I went through my first playthrough operating under the assumption it would be worth the WP to upgrade some rearguard arts too, and it ended up being mostly a waste of time, because the AI seems to rarely use those arts when you're switching as often as you can, and I remember my first playthrough being made much more difficult because of that. This is my fault, to be clear, but stuff like that annoys the hell out of me, and while it naturally isn't a problem I'll encounter again, I still find it to be misleading considering that the UI for art upgrading treats front and rearguard arts to be of equal relevance. But of course, that's not anywhere near enough to diminish the quality of combat in Torna. When it's operating at full capacity, Torna's combat is every bit as thrilling and satisfying as it was in the base game, and thankfully is abundant with charming character interactions that I live for when playing these games. Your Indeed. swordsmanship is an inspiration to me, Jin. Tis a marvel to behold. I simply removed all that was surplus. Ah, oh. oh, I see that attitude cost. extends to your words, too. Richard, mine's a key. Thomas, that's that, then. You two work well together. What have we got Jin, here? you better hold on to a driver like her. Yes, I don't need you to tell me that. I'm getting 
feel some awkward vibes between you and Jin, Laura. Is it complicated? What? What's that supposed to be? There's nothing going on between us at all. Don't worry, Lady Laura. I'm still your number one fan. One last gameplay thing that's received significantly more emphasis is the crafting system. I barely even acknowledged that this was a thing in the Xenoblade 2 video, but the crafting wasn't great for two primary reasons. One, the items you crafted generally didn't give you many valuable effects at all, and two, you couldn't douse or naturally find where collectibles you needed are located, so it basically required that you go on the Xenoblade wiki to find them. Torna addresses the first of these complaints and not the second. In fact, I would even go as far as to say the second complaint is an even more severe issue in Torna. The craftable items in Torna can give substantial combat effects, and Adam and Hugo even make permanent upgrades to the party via their items that can increase run speed, enemy luring range, and the likelihood to find items from a collection point. Crafting has also been a central factor in the progression of the affinity charts too. That's pretty cool, and I appreciate the emphasis put on making the system more substantial. And if you're going out of your way to interact with most collection points, you normally will have most of the collectibles you need to craft at least one of each item. However, the fact that the crafting system has been further incentivized and there has been no attempt to make finding specific collectibles easier is pretty obnoxious. For example, Hugo can't search golden or large machines until you reach a resco, but the game still shows you his whole crafting list as if to suggest, hey, uh, you're kind of neglecting Hugo's crafting, you should maybe try to find some of the stuff like right now maybe? So you spend the first 70% of the game not being able to craft most of Hugo's items. In Xenoblade 1 and 2, searching for obscure collectibles is annoying, but there's probably a collective 2% of my Xenoblade 1 and 2 playtimes being frustrated by needing to look up where a collectible was. In Torna, that percentage has significantly risen because of how much more important the crafting is. I spent nearly an hour trying to look for where the hell I could find muscle branches to get that same upgrade for Hugo I mentioned just now. The Xenoblade wiki page didn't have a suggestion on where muscle branches could be found in Torna, so I had to run around by myself and I couldn't find one anywhere. Then I looked in the wiki page's comments section and someone else had that location memorized. Why couldn't there be like a map feature that lets you seek out a specific item? Breath of the Wild did exactly this, and a number of staff members working on Xenoblade 2 worked on that game. Hell, you can track community members in Torna itself, why couldn't there have been some kind of equivalent for materials? I think the Xenoblade series at large is guilty of this go on the internet and look up this obscure collectible you need mentality, and I hope Xenoblade 3 has at least some kind of collectible seeking radar or map marker. However, what Torna excels at most is how it manages its prequel status. Much like how I found Xenoblade 2's sequel setup to enhance the meaning of Xenoblade 1's characters and story, Torna does that to an even greater degree to the base game's benefit, and it enhances so many little details I wouldn't have paid any mind to had Torna not existed. It's interesting to piece together in a side quest why Minoth would help build the Garfont mercenaries after Laura talks about wanting to do something very similar. I love how whenever the story progresses, Minoth writes a new piece highlighting what he's just experienced, which illustrates the way his passion grows into him becoming a playwright 500 years later. His first-hand involvement in the plot of Torna also makes sense as to why he knew exactly what went down in the Aegis War enough to write a damn play about it. I similarly enjoy the significance added to Jin's mask knowing that Laura made it for him, which is pretty in character when noting how Laura's been crafty ever since childhood. I like how it's better illustrated why Jin makes a point to free Haze in the base game, and why he reacts to her hand touching his face in the way that he does. His descent into madness also feels much more gradual when accounting for Torna's story alongside the base game story. You see his faith and hope begin to crack after all he goes through in Torna, beginning the game arguing with Mithra about how fighting for change isn't a vain gesture, but then once he gets to Malos, you see him hesitate to completely reject a very, very similar point of view. A ton of details like this gives Jin's trauma and reasoning for his actions 500 years in the future a layer of understanding. It's clear why Laura meant so much to him. She was the reminder he always needed to help him hold on to hope and push on. It's easy to say, oh, we'll just be hopeful, but I think we all know just how difficult it can be to put that into practice all the time. Everybody needs help sometimes, and Laura is essentially Jin's entire life, and he doesn't really care about anything else. This thankfully helps him stay hopeful through Laura's influence, but it's also exactly why her death absolutely destroyed his life, because that's basically what she was. And you perfectly understand why it drove him mad, not being able to forget about her death. It gives the climaxes of chapters 7 and 9 even more weight and emotional resonance. Jin's first illustration of true fear in that story is when Rex reaches the level of mastery that he and Laura had, and because of that, Rex becomes the best driver in all Rex's history. By chapter 9, Jin has basically accepted he's done exactly what Laura wouldn't have wanted him to do after her death. Instead of attempting to inspire and instill hope in others, he only tried to destroy it. 
It's only once Jen is met with that same unshakable optimism and faith in the best of us all that he saw in Laura that he realizes this. And seeing his final moments after playing Torna is uniquely depressing yet fulfilling, especially because of Torna's ending theme, A Moment of Eternity. I can say just as much, maybe even more about Mithra and her trauma. Many folks who were lukewarm on her in the base game found a lot more to love about her after seeing just how horrifying it was for her to live with the guilt of sinking Torna and witnessing the death of so many innocent people at her and Malice's hands. It does a lot of legwork into helping us get an idea of why she's so standoffish at first when she appears in the base game. I don't think anyone could watch Mithra's breakdown at the end of Torna and have any doubts about why this would drive her to hate herself as much as she does. And Again, it explains why she'd get so mad about needing to show herself to the world again. Torna even further heightens Rex's character too, because you really begin to understand how meaningful his unrelenting love and acceptance is to Pyra and Mithra considering what they experience in Torna. Torna adds further value to an already excellent relationship established in the base game when one of the characters isn't even present in Torna itself. Even characters with less to do like Bridget illustrate the effect the driver's resonance can have on a Blade's personality. Torna's Bridget and base game Bridget are strikingly different from each other most of the time. In Torna, Bridget is far more cocky and argumentative, whereas in the base game Bridget is far more polite and understanding, especially with Pyra and Mithra of all characters. But it doesn't feel like a betrayal of her character either, because she had moments of brutal honesty and competitive playfulness in the base story. It more or less feels like 500 years in the future she's grown more mature, be it from the evolution of Blades over time or her resonance with Morag, who's about as mature as it gets. Even briefly establishing why I think Torna kicks ass as a prequel demonstrates how well it slots in with the base game's story and characters. Every time I replay the base game, Torna's story enhances what were seemingly minor moments into some of my favorites in the entire series. And Torna doesn't feel like a stretched out excuse to make more money off of Xenoblade 2. It feels like Takahashi and his team genuinely had a big enough story to tell here that warranted the depth and exploration that Torna got. I take it for granted now, as I'm sure many of us do, but it's still just so insane that we basically got an expansion dedicated to the villain's origin story. I really do think that Xenoblade 2 as an experience would be lesser without Torna. I admire how much the story can still manage to surprise you despite how many major events are spelled out in the base game. As much as I don't like him as a villain, making Gort a secondary villain to provide more personal stakes to Laura's journey early on enhances her as a character quite a lot. And understanding the exact reason Mithra considers the events of Torna so traumatizing and the exact reason she breaks down makes the mention of it in the base game feel incredibly uncomfortable in the best way possible. I absolutely didn't play Torna for the first time with a fair expectation for it, and I certainly didn't take the time to appreciate how many great things it added to Xenoblade 2's gameplay loops and story. That said, from what I understand I still think I have a few more problems with Torna than the average person and I want to share what complaints I have to try and elaborate as best I can. I'm going to try to balance out my complaints with positives to hopefully avoid this from becoming an exhausting rant because most of the complaints I have with Torna are either mixed or are made up for in some capacity. If there's one common criticism I see held against Torna, it's that the way the game handles side quests is frustrating, and I would agree with this. This is my biggest problem with Torna for a number of reasons, not just because of the community requirements. This is going to be a long rant, so prepare yourselves. I understand what the game is trying to do with the community level requirements. It's giving you a reason to try to connect with Oresco and its citizens by way of making you complete a number of quests. I understand that that's what the game is trying to do. That said, I think it potentially achieves the exact opposite for some, including myself to an extent. I need to preface this conversation by noting that I'm a completionist by heart. I go out of my way to 100% most games that I enjoy, including long ass games like Xenoblade 1 and 2. I would have probably loved 100%ing Torna on my first playthrough if I was allowed to do so at my own pace. 
Going after the quests in these games usually isn't the highlight for me, but when you're able to tackle each of them when you want to, it's usually a good time. Having said this, going from Xenoblade 2 and its fairly average quest design to Torna gave me the impression that I could take each of these at my own pace. I'd assume that's how most players would think to approach this game. And Torna apparently found it to be a wonderful idea to put an arbitrary brick wall to your progress, not just once, but twice, and only at the very end of the game in Oresco. It feels like a joke when the game does it before the final dungeon especially. It is worth mentioning that this kind of block existed in Xenoblade X, and while I've only played up to the first one in that game, at least it's being established early on that this blade leveling is likely a recurring mechanic you'll need to pay attention to throughout the game. While the idea behind the community system was, I can only assume, to make you enjoy your time with the people of Oresco, it just ended up making me resent them partially because they really only felt like resistance to my progress throughout the story. Then again, even if I were given the option to do the quest when I wanted to, I would still be dissatisfied because the ending Oresco gets really doesn't hit how it should in my opinion. This is a very difficult feeling for me to articulate, so I hope I can manage to not utterly baffle everyone with this tangent I'm about to go on. There is such a disappointingly minimal effect that Oresco's destruction has on me because there feels like such a lack of emphasis on the citizens of Oresco aside from the aftermath of the first attack. Considering how Torna is the game that makes you help all of these people, it drives me crazy how during the two attacks on Oresco, in the cutscenes, we get so little time to see what happens to everyone or how they're reacting when Malice is attacking. Getting a detailed look at the ways an average person reacts to extraordinary events or moments of tragedy can significantly heighten the weight of those moments. They can almost serve as an audience's tether to the feeling of, holy shit, if I was in this situation, I would lose my mind. This is one of my favorite things about the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, which, by the way, are some of my favorite movies ever made. He stole that guy's pizza! Seeing how the people of New York feel about Spider-Man is so consistently charming as well as emotionally compelling. The city feels like a character because there's significant time devoted to highlighting how the average people feel. The payoff to this is seen and felt in the best moment of the entire trilogy. Let's just say, the way Oresco was handled during the ending is immensely disappointing to me on that front. During the first attack cutscene, the only thing you see is the gargoyles are blowing up some building. You just hear some pew pew laser sounds in the background and see some gargoyles are now running about the place. By contrast, during the gameplay sequence, you can find some NPCs being visibly shaken by what's happening. Several people are seen likely dead due to the falling rubble, and you can find a few people in the lower level of the inn taking shelter. This stuff is really good, and it really lets you take in the fact that there are people being hurt by Malice's actions, but I desperately wish the effect on the citizens was made more apparent in the cutscenes. It would be one thing if I only felt this way about the first attack, but the impact of the second attack also doesn't feel massive or emotionally impactful to me either, because in terms of how the citizens react, it consists of a single shot of about six hard-to-recognize citizens being blown up, Milton and Mikhail embracing, and then we immediately move on? Wh uh, why? After how much emphasis was put on this city, this is the most we see of how the citizens react to this horrific attack? I feel like it had the potential to be so much more effective if we just had more time to see the other citizens besides Mick and Milton during this part. I can imagine some folks will say I'm asking for too much here, but I really don't think I am, and I say that because Monolith did exactly what I'm talking about absolutely perfectly in Xenoblade 1. In the attack on Colony 9, there is a real impact to be felt regarding the destruction taking place there. During the first half of that story beat, you're constantly being shown why the Mechon are an enormous threat, and you constantly are being shown how these innocent people are responding to this nightmare of an ambush. It's scary, it's thrilling, and it's tragic. You're shown establishing shots of several villagers reacting in fear to the siren sounding off, and some more fleeing from the Mechon. The first thing you see when you make it back is a Hom being eaten alive right in front of you, which even if it's a generic NPC, you feel some sort of sympathy as well as fear because now you have to run through the town as it's being destroyed and overrun by Mechon. You do the same in Torna, but the track you hear as you run through a burning Oresco is a track I associate with the Ardanian soldier battles in Torogoth, which, needless to say, does not achieve the tone I feel like they should have really gone for here. Like, seriously, compare the difference in intensity between these two tracks.
That's not even noting the fact that in Colony 9, there are mech on everywhere. Given that you can't fight any of them without the Monado, your best option here is to run for your life. It isn't even just that mech on are everywhere. If you look around the outskirts of the village, you can actually see that the wildlife has seemingly disappeared. You can see the gargoyles in the distance in Torno, but you only encounter three of them, all of which are mandatory fights that really aren't all that difficult. Like, it's kind of hard to feel like everything's going to shit when the gameplay doesn't contain that same tension the story's maintaining. In Colony 9, it's a desperate struggle for our heroes to stay alive. You watch Ryan and Shulk barely make it to the residential district, and it feels like anything could happen. I'm not trying to say that this should just be Xenoblade 1's intro repeated. Colony 9 does get significantly more time dedicated to its attack sequence, but considering how both of these attacks have incredibly significant things in common regarding the effect they have on the story and characters, I find it incredibly disappointing how little Oresco's destruction really affects me, especially considering you spent a significant portion of game time in Oresco, whereas you likely spend 1-3 to three hours in Colony 9 at most. And the reason why this is such a huge problem for me is because, more than any other campaign in this series, Torna seems like it's really trying to emphasize the terror and tragedy of how many people die during this major story event, as well it should. Yet, the only people I end up caring about at the ending are the main characters reacting to the tragedy from afar because it seems like that's all the story is really interested in showing me. It feels so antithetical to Torna's main focus. This is the game that's constantly making your priorities center on the average people. And yet, when the story has a prime opportunity to make you feel horrible about witnessing the death of these innocent people, it feels like the story just wants to move past that almost immediately. And it's extremely disappointing because these developers have executed this kind of thing absolutely perfectly before. The characters' reactions are great, especially Mithra's, and that part of the ending is absolutely perfect. Even if I don't care much about the attack myself, the fact that everyone else does is really important. Milton's death works really well for the story's purposes, but he's also not a character I really care about that much. I don't know why, but Milton's death just never makes me feel as sad as I know it should. He's not a bad character, but the only real reason I end up caring about him is that he's friends with characters I actually care about. I understand that there's a lot going on in this scene, and I'm not asking for like a 2 minute long Infinity War style scene where we slowly watch everyone die. But ever since I first beat the game to my most recent playthrough, these chunks of the ending just never hit how they should for me. I think the base game's final boss communicates a similar feeling perfectly, something akin to this is all I'm really asking for here. In Oresco's destruction, we get so little time to process any of it that it significantly weakens its impact in my opinion. The fact that the Tornin King's only illustration of any kind of real human emotion is this inexpressive while watching his kingdom fall to ruin is like, truly the cherry on top of everything. Don't get me wrong here, I love this game's ending and the rest of this scene is fucking fantastic and I mean that but it makes me sad how little Oresco plays a part in that. Now, <clears throat> with that long ass story side of the tangent out of the way, if there was any game in this series that would make you do most of the quests, I think it makes perfect sense that it would be Torna. It's a smaller game, and to me it seems evident that there was a lot more juice put into Torna's quests compared to the base game's quests. Having the player work through most of them is an idea that I can get behind in some capacity. It makes sense to slow down the pacing right before the ending goes all out so it's not just a quick blast through everything at the end of the game. And I honestly don't think having progression blocks like this is too terrible of an idea either. I think what makes it so irritating in execution is because the community system up until the first block in Oresco is not properly emphasized to make the player go through the game in the right way. That being doing the quests as they become available to you so you don't have a mountain of them to endure at the end of the game. Even playing in that way doesn't allow you to get past the second block without hitting a wall, and I just can't see that as a good thing, I just can't. A fun thing I discovered on my recent playthrough is if you do all the quests and community leveling you can before Malice's first attack, you can actually get past the first Oresco block with no issues. I was taken by surprise when I was immediately thrown into the ambush after the conference with the Torn and King, and it felt good to keep the pace going. No such workaround exists for the community level 4 block, and it feels exhausting to get past it no matter how much preparation you do. I get that this is the point in the game where you're seeing the effect that Malice has had on the city, right? But necessitating that you do so many of these quests and springing the community system's importance on you at the very end of the game seems designed to irritate someone on their first playthrough. It clearly did exactly that for many. The reason why on a gameplay level I have such a huge gripe with this and not something like field skills in the base game really has everything to do with how the game conditions you to play it. 
Don't get me wrong, field skills certainly can be annoying and in optional cases blade summoning dependent, but the only checks that are required to get past for story progression are lenient enough that even when I barely understood what they even were on my first playthrough, I got past all of the checks because the game made it consistently clear that they were important to pay attention to throughout the game. The community system is introduced to you early on, but the way it affects your progression is not made clear to you at all. For all you know, adding more people to the community is just a satisfying way of showing you all the people you've chosen to help. You know, kind of like the affinity charts in Xenoblade 1 and X, which was a mechanic you didn't need to pay any mind to in those games, despite those two charts being enormous and filled with hundreds of named NPCs. The first time the community system is shown to dictate your progress is the first block in Oresco, which is, you know, 14 hours into this 20 hour long game. I genuinely do think it is perfectly acceptable to make it so you have to experience most of the quests in this game, but at least make it clear that the game is expecting you to do this much questing earlier so it doesn't feel so exhausting and cheap. Torna also has this annoying habit of throwing way too many quests at you all at one time in a way that feels really intimidating. After you beat Gort and head back to Blashem Co, holy shit, five new quests for you to take care of. It's overwhelming and also contributes to that frustration of needing to do all of this because my first instinct here is to go, uh, all right, I'm gonna do those when I feel like it. I think a better place for the first block to go could be when you reach Aletta for the first time. It already mostly works with what the game is making you do anyways. Your first trek through here is essentially walk around to get food rations, walk over here, realize the bridge is out, kill the gogols blocking you, go back, then the bridge is rebuilt. Introduce the community system's progression importance here, and I think that alone could help make the final one feel perfectly fine because the game is telling you, hey, you should be doing all the quests you can because this is going to be important later. Aletta is another important place to gear up before making the long trek to Oresco, and I think it could help you establish an even stronger connection to Adam's camp. There's also Hyber Village too. I think that would be a suitable place to move the Desert Medicine quest if need be. The point is, Oresco isn't the only settlement on the Tornan Titan that should have gotten this much emphasis. As it is now though, I don't understand why they'd not only put two community level blocks in one place, but also do it twice so close together. I think the worst part of this, in classic Xenoblade 2 fashion, is that I found it really only distracts me from how great the quests actually are in Torna. Had I not been forced to do them whenever the game felt like it, I wouldn't have had anything in my way from enjoying these quests for what they were in the first place, and I likely wouldn't have come out on the other side nearly as mixed on the game as I was. The quests in this game are absolutely the best selection among the numbered game campaigns thus far, and it's such a damn shame that people had such a similar experience to mine that made it so much more difficult to appreciate the writing in these quests. I wish some of these were retroactively patched into the base game. There's a quest chain where you need to get driver, blade, and fusion combos for these mercenaries to assign you to a job that they end up losing by the end anyways. Not only is that funny, but it also does a way better job helping a player come to grip with these mechanics and understanding how essential they are to the combat. In Thicker Than Water, you end up needing to break the news to Hedwin that not only was Torgoth burned to the ground, but also that his wife was killed. You're able to reunite him with Callie and Kelly, who were those kids looking for their dad in Gormot during that main story detour, and not only does Mithra illustrate her newfound compassion and maturity through how honest she is with Hedwin right away, but Adam ends up crying when the three of them unite. That is so goddamn good, and no doubt one of my favorite quests in the entire series. Now, not all of the quests live up to that same standard, there are a lot more of them than I remember that boil down to, go grab a bunch of materials for me. 30 seconds of material deposition later. Wow, thank you, I will now join your community. There's also this one quest where Hayes says something so shitty that I don't understand at all. This dickhead Bri Bri, I fuck it, I don't care how you pronounce his name, not only proudly declares that he hit his son regularly throughout his childhood, but also threatens to hit his son more because, oh no, the king's garden isn't spotless after what was essentially a bombing. Good thing he has his priorities straight, it's not like there's anything else to worry about at the present moment. And this doesn't resolve by the conclusion of the quest, by the way. Then Hayes says, and I quote, I am so happy they finally reached an understanding. To which Mithra replies, uh, Hayes, how is that an understanding? Why is Mithra, of all characters, the clear voice of reason here? I thought Rex being impatient with Nia during that bit after the Spirit Crucible was bad, and it is, but this is even worse because I really don't know any other way to interpret what Hayes is saying other than, oh well, I guess some relationships are just predicated on abuse. If anything, after understanding how wonderfully Gort's methods ended up affecting Laura's mental health in the long run, how in the fuck does she say this without any sense of doubt that maybe, just maybe, that's sort of horrible and not how you should raise or interact with your child? <clears throat> ah, sorry about that tangent, that quest really bothers me in case that wasn't apparent already. 
No doubt, quests of this caliber are not very memorable in any sense, but the standard level of detail for many other quests managed to significantly outweigh the bad quests. Seeing Minoth request Marae hand deliver her finest pottery to Tio is a really great moment of characterization for him, and it makes it one of the most memorable quests in the game. Morumo's attempt at self-harm being stopped by his friends and Adam offering him a second chance is really good stuff, and a worthwhile payoff to the long-running pollen orb hunting quest. The slate pieces serve as a perfect Golden Sculptua-esque game-wide collectible for the game, and I can really only see that kind of quest working for a smaller campaign like Torna. It makes for a fun overarching side objective that really heightens the sense of reward for exploring every region extensively. A lot of Torna's quests actually build off of previous ones and link together in really interesting ways. For example, Lyda is brought into a second quest in Oresco when her father isn't helping build the city's safety bunker. It does a great deal in making Arrest feel like a world instead of a game world. Community Spirit brings a lot of the community members together and culminates into revealing that Adam has a wife. It's really cute stuff and it makes the number of quests you've endured feel worth it. Even if your 100% reward is the dreaded Yeah, Mario Sunshine Postcard, it's perfectly befitting of Torna, and a great visual to demonstrate the positive effect you've had on all rest in the time you had. I love the great Torn and Cook-Off. Some of the lines of dialogue during this sent my sides into orbit, and it's so nice to see the party just chillax and focus on an innocent competition instead of thinking about Malos 24-7. I'm really happy I managed to see these quests for what they were on this revisit. They're an absolute treat all around. Regretfully for me, it's still difficult to view the stuff like the community level 4 wall as anything but disguised padding, and to this day, it's still the main thing that makes replaying Torna a less enticing idea than replaying the base game or Xenoid 1 despite it being so much shorter. How can you be so heartless? Now, I have a feeling I know what some might have to say in rebuttal to this complaint. Well, there are some fireside chats at the campsites that help give the characters time to provide more unique conversations in a similar vein to Heart to Hearts, right? To which I say, I sort of see it, but I don't really agree. Now, bear in mind, Heart to Hearts are probably my favorite mechanic in this series. I think they're absolutely brilliant and one of the best mechanics I've seen in any RPG. They really go an extra mile in connecting me to the cast of characters in all of these games. Even if characters like Fiora, Ricky, Dromark, Rock, Aegean, and Tora don't get a lot to work with compared to other characters in their stories, if I can see them interact in cute ways with Heart to Hearts, that's honestly all I need to love those characters. That's how much Heart to Hearts elevate my experiences with these characters. Future Connected's quiet moments don't make for an ideal substitute for Heart to Hearts considering that they aren't interactive, but I think I prefer that game's approach to Torna's for two reasons. One, they're often lighter and non-story related conversations, and two, they take place at different locations so as to spice up the scenery. Quiet moments feel like worthwhile, sometimes sillier side conversations that usually aren't just restating things that the game has already told you regarding the main objective. In Torna, many fireside chats unlock whenever the story progresses even a little bit, and a handful of them can be charming and interesting character banter, but plenty of these conversations also end up just restating what the main story told you and adding very little else. In fact, the tutorial that tells you what the chat function does explicitly states that it's mostly just there to help you figure out how to proceed. I don't mean to generalize all of them to be this kind of conversation, but there are just way too many of them that play out this way to my liking. You really have to sift through some truly mind-numbingly boring fireside chats before you see one of them that actually functions as a replacement for a heart-to-heart. -heart. There are some character-driven conversations in the main story that help make up for this in part, though. Laura and Adam discussing on the Titan warship how Adam doesn't feel like an adequate wielder of the Aegis, Jin and Laura's conversation where Laura establishes her crush on Jin, Adam and Hugo's first on-screen conversation about how ruling is a scary thought to the former and the latter preferring to be out on the front lines instead of sitting atop a throne, and Hayes making her jealousy of Jin known before reaching the Dana Desert. That whole section of story at Hyber Village in particular is amazing and rich with great character moments. There's also plenty more character injected into the cast during side quests compared to the base game. There are even some cute quirks you learn about this cast, like Laura disliking being on ships, Hayes being afraid of ghosts, and Jin being a chef. For what it's worth, Torna injects a good amount of character into these guys throughout the game, but it feels like if there were any Xenoblade game that should have gotten heart to heart or a suitable equivalent that it should have been Torna. Especially considering how this game really appears to want to sell you on this cast of characters especially. The characters aren't bad without heart to hearts, but it's just disappointing because this cast doesn't get as much room to grow on you as the other ones do. Maybe I'm just being a baby about all of this, but I think another reason I miss Heart to Hearts in this game is because of how they added a comedic layer to the character interactions as well. I wouldn't consider any of the Xenoblade games to be consistently hilarious throughout the main plot, but the Heart to Hearts in these games are funny. I don't care who you are. Who would have known that Pyra could be so deeply cruel? That wasn't my intention at all. I I'm sorry. I just thought that the joke wasn't up to your usual standard. Ah! 
Most of Torna's comedic moments usually amount to making fun of Mithra, which, like, the simpleton joke I think is fine, Mithra's clearly in the wrong in this situation, but the scene that drags out the joke that Mithra bad cook feels like a joke they didn't need to make, especially considering how this is something the game has already made explicitly clear through her crafting dialogue and menu card. We didn't need two minutes of Mithra bad cook. Mithra bad cook. Oh, but, d but do you guys get it? Mithra's not good at cooking. It it's a pretty funny joke when you think about it. I mean, Mithra, you get it. She's bad at cooking. I don't say any of this to say that the cast in Torna is bad. Certainly not. And it's important to recognize the fact that this game is a seventh of the base game's length in cutscenes. It's perfectly fine to not get as much depth as the cast that gets 70 hours to grow on you as opposed to the 20 that Torna gets. I just wish that we got more character-driven conversations akin to quiet moments or heart-to-hearts. <laughs> Okay, I promise I'm almost done bitching. Unfortunately though, this last complaint really bums me the hell out. For one thing, I can kind of understand why this game has this secret final boss with Gort at the end. This battle is meant to feel most personal to Laura to give her closure on her relationship with her abuser, and I think it's meant to illustrate that these kind of personal demons often aren't completely dealt with in one encounter, right? Now, I am incredibly lucky, and I haven't dealt with any significant abuse myself, and it seems that, for people who have, Laura's decisions and reactions to Gort throughout the story are portrayed in a way that seem well handled in such a way that can make victims of abuse feel heard and understood, and that is wonderful. Full stop. Nothing that I have to say about this is more important than the fact that this portrayal works for people who have gone through something this terrible. You get to a point where, when you have such distance from your abusers, that it just isn't really that important what happens to them anymore. And that scene spoke to me on such a level and made me feel such a connection with Laura because she fucking gets it. The reason I'm conflicted here is because, for one thing, this battle is really boring compared to the excellent battle with Malos that you just had. Pretty much nothing that you've learned about the combat is being tested here other than vanguard switching, maybe. Mechanically speaking, it's an enormous step down from what you just did. In fact, you literally can't lose the fight. The game may as well just be playing itself. This series has a notable number of fights where your increase in power is being communicated by basically making the subsequent fight unlosable, but in this instance, I'm not really convinced that it works here. This device is often used to communicate a clear increase in power, and I don't understand the value of putting this baby easy fight just after this unique and dynamic final fight with Malos. The previous fight had all the stakes and tension and memorable scenery swelling into a wonderful test of what you've learned throughout the game, and by comparison, this battle has so little going for it other than the personal stakes. Gort is probably my least favorite villain in this series with Galgar right behind him. He's about as black and white pure evil as you can get. He really doesn't get a backstory at all other than that he's a thief who stole Jin's crystal, he's an abusive dick, and he was subjected to Indol's involuntary blade eater human experiments. There's nothing more to say about him, and that in and of itself isn't entirely a problem. Trying to make this abusive asshole understandable isn't really important, he's just a bad person you shouldn't see any part of yourself in. That much alone is perfectly fine, I have absolutely no problem with villains like that. But in that case, there has to be something else about them that can make them interesting or entertaining to be around. I once again turn to Mumkar, who has a lot in common with Gort. Mumkar doesn't really have much going on when talking about motivation. He's just jealous of Dunban for being so popular, and otherwise is just on Egil's side because he's as powerful as ever now that he's a faced mechon. He is one of my favorite villains, period, because he not only has personal ties to the main party, not only does he help flesh out the story's theme surrounding revenge, but he's also incredibly fun to watch, and he's a major threat to you throughout the story. You feel a sort of oh shit feeling seeing him come back throughout each story beat because it's established early on that he is more than capable of kicking your ass. Oftentimes he has the upper hand on you whenever he shows up. There is always a sense of palpable tension when he's around. Gort encounters you two times and both times he's really not that intimidating at all. If he was shown to have burnt down Torgoth or killed Laura's mother himself, that would have significantly elevated the personal stakes and tension of that fight. In fact, I really don't get why that isn't what happens. I could really only see that strengthening Laura's hatred of Gort and it would make her sparing him even more meaningful, but I digress. The reason why this is a problem is because we really aren't shown that Gort is capable of anything dangerous other than doing some very basic planning by getting mercs to bypass Hayes' restrictive abilities. The second and larger problem with Gort is that half of his time on screen is him just telling and rarely ever showing us why we should be intimidated by him. Mumkar really gasses himself up, yes, but it's consistently shown to you that he is more powerful than you. It would follow that this dude would be having an absolute power trip as a result. 
We don't see Gort get even close to touching Laura until Jin steps in, and it doesn't make you feel as though he's really a threat as much as he is an inconvenience. The second encounter with him also doesn't feel very tense, mostly due to the stuff I just said, and sure, he looks intimidating, but he's shown to just be pathetic, and instead of feeling excited that he's coming back, I just roll my eyes and groan. He doesn't really have an upper hand here, so it's hard to feel intimidated by him, again, because most of this scene is him just saying that he's going to hurt these people who have already proven to be fully capable of fighting people way more powerful than him. This is one of the villains in this series that I just can't take seriously in any way. I don't think there's really anything interesting about him, and the personal buildup between the player and him is absolutely nothing compared to Malos, a villain you've gotten to know extensively through both campaigns from the very beginning. He actually presents an opposing ideology to the party that's shown to have not a lot, but a small sense of legitimacy seeing as Jin doesn't completely reject it, and that's illustrated really well in this moment. Oh yeah. Are you a blade or not? You know it as well as I do. What humans are really like. <sighs> you think they're all like your precious driver? There is a battle of ideologies going on here. Gort just attacks you because he's insane, and there's really nothing more going on. I mean, he gets everyone on the topic of the world always containing strife and it leads to that really great bit where Laura says we should always hold on to hope, but that message isn't something that could only be achieved by fighting Gort. Fuck, even Galgar peddles the half high Entia supremacy narrative in Future Connected, even if he doesn't do much of anything important outside of that. I don't have an issue with Laura getting more closure at all, but to throw this in at the very last second just doesn't feel natural after everything else the game already has to tie up during the ending. I honestly like that this encounter says that people like Gort are beyond mercy, and seeing Laura eliminate her demon is satisfying, but it just can't help but feel like the game is slightly fumbling what's otherwise an incredible ending. If you disagree with me, I want you to let me know why. I don't say any of this with the intent to remove any meaning from the scene, and there's every chance I'm not seeing something. I'm mostly just saying all of this because the final fight with Malos is so good, and I just wish the game rode that wave to the end and found a different way to give Laura closure by the ending. I apologize for how lengthy all of those complaints were, and I don't mean to come off so negative on this game at all. I just find that my problems with Torno, more often than not, I am passionately bothered by. <laughs> In spite of all of what I've just said, I really do believe that Torna is a kick-ass game, and I love it as I do the other Xenoblade games, and I'm not just saying that. I wouldn't have gone out of my way to purchase the game a second time physically and played through it twice for this video if I didn't love it. I think one thing Torna does the best of any of these games is establishing its own unique sense of style visually and sonically. The only complaint I have here is that the area theming isn't as impressive as the other games in the series in my opinion. For what they are, they look appealing and they're very dense in their construction, and the atmosphere mostly doesn't disappoint, but there are a few too many grasslands and desert areas for such a short game in my opinion. The secret areas are a really distinct contrast to the main areas, but there wasn't an entire area where I thought to myself, holy cow, that's something I've never seen in a game before, that's absolutely gorgeous, the way I still do for both Xenoblade 1 and 2. Even Future Connected to some extent has some really visually distinct areas that help the Bionis shoulder stick out better, and that game only takes place on one Titan. I also find it extremely odd how Aleta and Dana both get the same tracks and that Gormont and Lasaria don't get a night theme. Considering how essentially every area in Xenoblade 2 gets its own day and night theme, it feels kind of lacking Torna doesn't have the same attention to detail for stuff like that. Or just not as thorough attention to detail for stuff like that. The music unique to Torna is excellent, and I just wish we had more of it. I also missed having a mysterious distant landmark to look at throughout the game. Oresco sort of fills that role, and for what Torna is, that being a very community driven game, I suppose it makes sense, but it also didn't really excite me thinking of what could be there compared to the World Tree or the Makanis or even Alchemoth early on in Future Connected. That said, Torna does have a unique opportunity to explore what Gormot would look like 500 years before the events of the base game, and it's like you're peering back in time after playing the base game. I haven't experienced anything like that in a game before. Gormot's remixed area theme is smooth as all hell, and I loved how Lyda and her blade named the Lido Oasis and Waytree after their expedition. Whether retroactively added or not, these landmarks have a meaning behind their names, and that's the kind of thing I'll never forget going back to base game Gormot. While it more or less is pretty similar to what was already in the base game, the care and attention to detail were put in where it should have to make it feel familiar but still new. The Titan feels like it's in an earlier stage of growth now that the exploration is far less vertical due to the shorter trees. Torgoth goes from being a bustling and vivid city with this energetic Irish jig sounding energy to the most melancholy and haunted settlement in the series next to Agniritha. 
Torna's UI also looks beautiful on the quick travel map. I love the way it highlights what portion of the Tornan Titan you're on. It makes the map feel more cohesive. The golden color grading, if that's the appropriate term, isn't my favorite look for the series, but it fits the game's time period and story perfectly. The way I see it, Torn is going for a sort of hazy or filtered nostalgic look, since surviving members of the party like Jin and Mikhail seem to hold this time period as the best of their lives, and I appreciate the way that's communicated through the visuals in this game. Even if, on a technical level, it performs close to how the base game does, it's still just as impressive Monolith can manage to make these gorgeous environments look and run as well as they do on the Switch. I think, speaking about the construction of these areas, these are some of the best designed areas in the series. There are very few areas in these games that I don't like, and my bar is low enough to the point that if they have an enjoyable atmosphere, I'll mostly work through as much inconvenient navigation as you want, I won't complain too much. There's an incredible sense of balance to Torna's locations, and all the fast travel points are placed in convenient spots, so you have very minimal mindless walking around to get where you need to go. I didn't highlight it much in my Xenoblade 2 video, but the two Morth locations and other places like Temple Rancho could sometimes be annoying to revisit because of how fast travel points were too far apart or walking to wherever you needed to go could be a mind-numbing experience, and I think Xenoblade 1 is far more guilty of that same thing. I already felt that these games didn't have enough of this to bother me, but Torna has eliminated those feelings altogether. The enemy variety is as good as ever, and the area music is wonderful and stylistically distinct from the other entries in the series thus far. In order to get the most appreciation out of Torna's music, you must acquire a taste for Freeform Jazz. If you can somehow play this game and avoid the urge to shake in your seat to this regular battle theme, then you need to wake up and listen to this shit. Torna is easily the best piece of DLC I've ever played, and Monolith absolutely deserves recognition for getting so much mileage out of what resources they had. I find it's incredibly rare that a piece of DLC is celebrated, and even rarer that that piece of DLC is praised and considered a must-have for fans who have played the base game. It's an absolute treasure that we got to see more from this world and cast of characters, and nothing about Torna feels like an unnecessary excuse to reuse Xenoblade 2's assets so they could cash in on their existing audience. I'm so happy that my playthrough for this video ended up helping me grow to love it as others did, and that was, in no small part, thanks to my newfound appreciation for the story and characters. So, I'm officially a Tornan driver now. Okay, let's make some memories. One of Xenoblade 2's main themes threading these two campaigns together is the value of holding on to hope. Keeping your head up and believing that one day, things will get better is oftentimes what divides the heroes from the villains in this story. Jin and Nia both illustrate that better than anyone else. Jin had Laura to keep him optimistic that things would get better, but once the world takes her from him, he loses everything. There's nothing more for him to live on for, and it makes him turn into a sadistic asshole with no sympathy for the people that he kills. Nia is originally aligned with the villains in this respect because the world has rejected her. It doesn't accept her for who she is. I think at the absolute bare minimum, everybody wants to be accepted, and it's easy to understand why Nia ended up in the place that she did. Once Rex introduces several positive and supportive relationships into her life, she realizes that there is a place for her in this world, and she will fight to give everyone the chance to find their way as she did. Naturally, Torna's tone is much less optimistic throughout its runtime as it takes place during a devastating war, and yet several of its characters help begin that thread for the base game to carry out through its story. Laura is chief among them. Compared to Rex, she is much more moderate in her optimism, likely due to her being probably twice his age. In spite of her own family being far less present in her life compared to Rex, she contains an equal desire to fight and provide hope to anyone that she can to make the world a better place. But she doesn't remain hopeful all the time. Much like Rex, she needs a shoulder to cry on and people that she can count on. And she thankfully has that for most of her time in Torna. 
Holding on to hope on your own is pretty much impossible, and I appreciate the fact that both Rex and Laura aren't unrealistic in their ability to be optimistic by showing that it's okay to falter on that front because life is <laughs> fucking hard. A second thematic thread that ties in very heavily with hope is the duality of memories. Pyra and Mithra's memories for a lot of their lives serve as nothing but a reminder of their weaknesses and their capability to kill others. Their memories and their perceived idea of themselves rob them of any chance to look forward to anything but ridding the world of their existence. Rex then makes them feel that all the suffering that they've endured was worth it for the time and memories that they got to make with him. Memories can be a blessing and a curse. Sometimes those memories can hold us back more than they help us learn and move forward. Jin's inability to let go of the past lets him believe that humankind deserves to be destroyed. On the other hand, memories can sometimes be the exact reason we choose to move forward. It's how we learn and grow throughout our lives. Laura demonstrates that Jin's protection broke her free from a time when she lived in fear every single day. Her memories of that miserable time let her realize the value of her freedom during Torna's story. It's also why she wanted Jin to remember her more than anything, even if she didn't realize that it would greatly hurt him in the long run. It's there that Jin believes that humans and blades are fundamentally different when they really aren't. Blades returning to their cores, in essence, is still death, but the memories that they share with others will live on with other people, the same as it is for other humans. Memories are what give us a reason to keep living, so we can experience more amazing things, meet more wonderful people, and eventually reach a point where we feel something close to true happiness. Memories aren't solely good or bad, but the idea that we can make more of them is the kind of thing that keeps me going. It sounds real corny, but I find that the most valuable lessons I've learned throughout my life are often the ones that sound the corniest. The third and final theme that I read from this story is that we have to be willing to accept change to make our world better. Obviously, not all change is good. The hardest parts of our lives are the ones where we have to grapple with how different and uncomfortable change is. How many people do you know who fondly remember middle school? Practically none in my experience. Yet, change is necessary for our own evolution as people as well as the betterment of the world around us. Once again, the villains collectively reject this idea, and it's what makes them all the villains. They all, in some variation, believe that humankind doesn't change no matter how much time goes by. Collectively, I don't know how we'd ever be able to fully grasp whether or not that's true, and naturally every one of us is flawed in significant ways, but there will always exist those who never try to change. Ironically enough, it's because of those same villains that all rest is held back from change. Instead of working to overcome the worst parts of humankind, they all throw the entire lot into one category, and it causes them to operate in a total hypocrisy throughout being no better than the supposed worst of humanity. It's all well motivated considering that many of the villains became as they are because of a significant scarring change that heavily altered the course of their life. Their unwillingness to move on from that trauma is what makes them all villains. The heroes, meanwhile, all demonstrate the positive effect that our change can have on ourselves and other people. Pyra and Mithra, again, are able to overcome what's nothing short of a suicidal depression because Rex finally understands the extent of what they've dealt with over time. His change into a more aggressively understanding and supportive friend to them restores their will to live. His change over the course of the base game is what makes that story so gripping for me every single time. Morag learning to rely on other people is a less dramatic example, but one that's made visibly clear in many of the later fight scenes. Morag's operated on her own for quite a while now, and so she naturally makes it a point to get by on her own steam. Steadily, she wants to be a part of the party by sort of half asking Rex to help in Temperantia, and then again for the investigation in Chapter 6, all coming to a head after Nia revives Nile. She changes from her more strict and rigid military methods and operates in conjunction with the whole team. You can see it in the fights with Adam's Phantasms, Chapter 7's finale, and Amalthus' fight, just to name a few off the top of my head. In all of these battles, seeing her do her thing is even cooler than it was when she was operating solo. Seeing her and Zeke doing synchronized battle moves together is blissful. In short, her change works to benefit herself and her friends. All three of these enormous thematic threads are expertly retroactively integrated into Torna's story to lead to their evolution and exploration in the base game. The fact that Torna's ending is so heartbreaking leads to an enormous emotional catharsis after seeing that Laura and Rex are right, things will change. It creates a sense of satisfaction that, again, wouldn't have been there had Torna not existed or ended in the way that it did. Memories come into play with Jin and Mithra as I mentioned before, both of which are hurt by them, but we see the contrasting outcomes of each of them when Jin surrounds himself with others who are as nihilistic as he is, and Mithra surrounds herself with a loving group of goofballs. The difference in their story conclusions could not be more night and day. Again, it also plays out in less pronounced ways in the battle scenes, particularly when Adam and Mithra demonstrate their growth as Driver and Blade thanks to their memorable first encounter with Laura and Jin. All three themes are set up in ways that naturally overlap with each other, all the while simultaneously maintaining astounding character consistency for what comes after chronologically. To the creative minds behind the conception and execution of this story, I say job expertly well done. 
As I mentioned before, I do think Torna misses out on making this cast more memorable because of less screen time and no heart to hearts, but what they managed to squeeze into this 20 hour story is nothing short of impressive. I find myself adoring Laura less than I do Rex, mostly because his change over the course of Xenoblade 2 is a consistent driving motivator for me where Laura is already fairly mature by the time we control her. I also just plainly love how corny Rex is. Stuff like the salvager code and his other comedic moments almost always make me chuckle. Laura still makes for an excellent lead though, and I can see why some would find her more relatable or easy to connect with. Her design is incredibly strong, her voice work is incredibly consistent, and as much as I enjoy filling the role of a young adult protagonist, getting to control a more mature lead character is refreshing. Laura overcoming an abusive relationship is also incredibly compelling in its own way, and as much as I hate Gort, I'm glad he exists as a way to make Laura more relatable and sympathetic. Her will to create the concept of Garfont Village is incredibly admirable given what she's been through, and it's just one of many ways that she and Rex are inspiring. I adore her unique fighting style and the way it's justified through her being broke. It's strange that in a game with so many unique and thoughtfully crafted weapons that sometimes just punching and kicking the shit out of enemies can feel so gratifying. Laura certainly moved up in the world for me, but another character who did the same to an even greater degree is Adam. He's now my favorite character in the game by far next to Mithra. I, at first, was disappointed in how the myths built him up to be this stoic and all-knowing legendary hero, and he ended up just being a friendly and caring prince, and funnily enough, it's that exact thing that I now love about him. Myths, by their very nature, are a collective sharing of seemingly fanatical stories or tales of things that likely transform through word of mouth in so many ways after the passage of time. Adam's deeds as a man of the people and wielder of the Aegis overshadow who he actually was during that time period, and having considered this, I loved him thoroughly throughout this recent playthrough. Seeing him in action is a lot of fun, and good lord is it nice to hear battle dialogue from him other than- His new design also fits him insanely well as opposed to that hooded cloak that he was shown wearing in the base game. Seeing the seeds of Adam's fear beginning to take hold of him not only make him more relatable and compelling, but also excellently illustrates where Mithra's fear of herself originated from. Adam really doesn't want to do anything more than live a simple life, raise a family, work the land, and just take it easy. He's mostly just doing this stopping Mallow stuff because he's too selfless a person to delegate the enormous responsibility of wielding Mithra onto someone else, even if he's terrified of making one mistake and hurting other people. His heroic deeds weren't really centered around beating Mallows, but just helping other people and always prioritizing the lives of the common folk. Watching him cave in and seeing all of his worst fears come true all at once is heartbreaking, and I just wish we got a little more time to see the end of his story or the beginning of him creating Fonset Village. Like Mia, despite the more serious side to him, he also adds a great deal of comedic relief to every part of the game that he's involved in. I genuinely laughed out loud at some of his lines of dialogue, especially during the Great Torn and Cook-Off, and I think his personality absolutely steals the show during some of the quests. I thought him breaking down and crying easily was kind of annoying initially, but during my second playthrough I just had a wonderful time seeing him get all emotional. This man is precious. I'll get into Mithra soon, but if there's a trio to this main party who I still really don't jive with all that much, it's all of Team Hugo. Hugo himself, he's a nice enough guy. I really enjoy how he's similar to Adam in that he doesn't really want to rule for the sake of ruling, he wants to put himself on the front lines to make a difference. I absolutely adore his references to both Morag's art upgrading dialogue, this is the culmination of years of training. The culmination of years of sovereignty. And the Ardanian soldier battle dialogue. Oh, yes, you sir! Are you done. It recontextualizes this meme into almost being a wholesome way that the Ardanians in the future honor Hugo's memory by taking up his old catchphrases. This is how you integrate memes into your game. Aegean is okay, he gets a little more to work with than he did in the base game, where after you obtain him he has no lines of dialogue in the main story whatsoever. He gets some quests where his playful side can come out when he expresses interest in making crafts with Laura and Mithra, but he still doesn't really get a lot to work with. Finally, Bridget is just kind of annoying in this game. She's a great character 500 years in the future, and her relationship with Pyra and Mithra is really compelling in that story, but in Torna she's honestly just sort of a dick. I also understand that this version of Mithra is far more combative, leading to Bridget responding similarly, but most of the time when she's interacting with Mithra, she comes off as so pompous. Mithra is my favorite character in Torna, and their bickering can be funny, but honestly, I just find so little reason to care about this version of Bridget outside of shallow stuff like that. 
Lastly, a lot of the story characters unique to Torna like the Torn and King, Zetter, and basically every Indoline character other than Amaltus are so incredibly forgettable, and I say that because I literally forgot all of their names before re-watching the credits and looking at the Xenoblade wiki. The Torn and King doesn't get a name, not to mention a personality, other than Torn and King. Adam's wife also doesn't get a name, which I really don't get. It couldn't have hurt to come up with a name other than Lady Origo. <laughs> also, this dude who helps Amalthus is basically a walking plot device. He just so happens to discover back to back the similarities in the DNA of Titans, Blades, and Humans, figured out how to create Blade Eaters, and basically gave Amalthus the tools to help him rise to power for the next five centuries for reasons that are never explained. How convenient. That much is okay, because you know who in this story got phenomenal care put into them? I hope it would be agreed upon that it's both of the Aegises. Malos is particularly horrifying in Torna. He's an absolute killing machine and he doesn't give a shit about anything. In the base story, he's no doubt a menace, but he at the very least has something to lose and people he cares about. Even if he often doesn't show it in a very emotionally vulnerable way, Akos, Petroka, Mikhail, and Jin are people that he cares about in some capacity. I don't know if I'm reading into this too much, but the fact that Jin is the only other person that he treats as an equal and how much more intimate their scenes are together, it honestly seems like he might have a crush on Jin, and it clearly takes an extremely emotional toll on him when Jin dies. In Torna, however, Malos only has his goal of destroying everything and watching his victims struggle and perish. He's just here to set off some fireworks and watch the world burn, and it's honestly scary how unhinged he is. David Menken is selling it really well in his performance. He was already one of my favorites in the base game, but when he just goes crazy at the end, it's like nothing else. <laughs> That's it, perfect! That's the power that our father gave us! It's what the world has cried for since its birth! Me, you, we're here to give them what they want! Mithra's arc over the course of Torna is the best part of the game. She begins the game similarly to Malos, and steadily grows to understand why Adam and everyone else are on the right side of history here. Mithra's development illustrates her growing from being apathetic about all rest and humankind in general, to later fully embracing the bond between humans and blades, and growing to greatly care for the people of Torna. It's heartbreaking, then, that this exact thing is what makes her breakdown at the end so painful. Had she just remained as uncaring as Malos, she'd never have become as traumatized as she ends up being. And yet, these connections that she forged during this adventure end up hurting her, both before and after she wakes up. Laura ends up dead, and Jin loses the one person who he swore to protect no matter what. Hayes is likely returned to her core at the same time and becomes a slave to the one man in the world that she hated most, and dies soon after Mithra meets her again. Despite Adam being the one who sealed Mithra away for hundreds of years, she ends up being the one who shoulders all the blame for not being there to help Laura, Jin, Hayes, and Mikhail when Amalthus attacks Specia. All of that, and this isn't even discussing how before everything, the person that she grew closest to during Torna is killed because she demanded that he stayed in Oresco. Malos then causes her to break down and sink Torna, killing who knows how many more. I don't think it's difficult to understand how that may lead someone to become suicidal. Seeing Mithra's entire story unfold through these two stories is what makes her and Pyra one of my favorite characters of all time, and this is easily the best thing that Torna did. Torna's ending is a catastrophe, and they do not hold back on anything. The battle between Mithra and Malos is wonderfully choreographed and paced, and the voice acting is absolutely stellar. David Menken sounds like he's having the time of his life in the studio, and Sky Bennett's blood-curdling shriek is the only line in any other game that I've heard that is on par with Adam Howden's I'll kill you! The fact that we hear Mithra of all people sob and have absolutely no issue understanding why is a testament to how excellently this finale comes together. All of the major character deaths hit exactly how they should, and it all comes tumbling down into Mithra creating Pyra. Soon after Laura overcomes her demon, she's killed in the most painful way imaginable and causes Jin to endure 500 years of grief and loss with nothing left to live for but to become as horrible as the same man who ruined his life. Seeing that shot in Specio when Jin senses the ambush coming is haunting, it really is. Pyra, despite having just been created, ends up sealed away to complete solitude for 500 years with likely nothing else on her mind but a maelstrom of self-loathing. Adam likely lives on with a similar regret for everything that went wrong and barely gets any time to grieve the loss of so many of his friends before founding Fonset Village. Minoth does who knows what for however long before helping Laura and Adam's dreams live on through Garfont Village, which I think is the best case of anyone in the party. 
and it's so sweet that he manages to keep their spirit alive in spite of how horrific his own life had been. Wouldn't you know it, it's that exact spirit and care and hope for the future that gives way to the birth of the true heroes of Allrest, who helped the world find its way forward 500 years later. Despite how utterly tragic Torna's ending is, I love how it thematically so manages to provide a clear reason why our hopes and dreams are important to keep alive. Without the likes of Minoth and Adam creating and sustaining the two most welcoming places in Allrest, there'd be a very likely timeline where people like Van Damme and Rex would never come into existence. Sometimes it may seem futile in the present, but who's to say what kind of positive effect hope can have on what comes later? Even after the horribly depressing events of Torna, Xenoblade 2 still finds a way to remind us that hope is alive. And the more we remind ourselves of this, the more we'll grow into better people. Things will change, and we will always be reminded of that if we choose to believe in and carry out what the true heroes of Allrest believed in. I fucking love this game, and I think that's something I want to end this video talking about. I think I've been treating Torna and Xenoblade 2 in the wrong way throughout my experiences with them. I've treated Torna and Xenoblade 2 as if they're almost separate things. I think the fact that I made this discussion of Torna into a separate video is proof enough of this. To some extent, they are different campaigns, and I think it'd be a disservice to avoid recognizing their differences, but I think for me it's best treated as one game with two campaigns. There's a reason why Torna's official title is Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Torna of the Golden Country. Not just for marketing clarification's sake, but because, well, they're one in the same game. They collectively tell one story that's one of my all-time favorites, with some of my favorite characters ever, some of the most enchanting environments and concepts I've ever seen, and music that on command can bring me close to shedding tears. A tale of horrible tragedy, loss, and cruel misfortune that's combated with a sense of optimism that we can overcome all of those things if we're able to grow and change with the ones we love and above all, hold on to hope. A tale where we watch someone consumed by self-hatred overcome it because of the love of a pure-hearted boy. A girl afraid to show herself to the world who later does so because of the undying support from her friends. A robot who learns the value of promises and friendship, and the list goes on seemingly forever. These two campaigns create one story, one universe, and one game that I will hold dear for as long as I live. I sincerely hope that my criticisms of Torna haven't made it difficult to see that I love and cherish it as I do the base experience. It may certainly be a tough love at times, but Monolith made it clear that they didn't make this expansion out of greed. They didn't sell us an unfinished game that would later be complete if we paid them another $30. And they managed to correct mistakes and accept criticism for what they made prior while seemingly not sacrificing any of what they wanted to make. They made a prequel that enhances the base story exceptionally well and elevates many characters and events in that story. They made a DLC expansion that reworked major components of the combat system that ties into the world building perfectly while it plays like an upgrade to the combat system that came before. They gave us the best DLC campaign they could while simultaneously throwing in extra content into the base game, including a mode that likely added dozens upon dozens of hours to each player's playtime. They gave us the best goddamn DLC I've ever played. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 may be a flawed experience, but it's one worth celebrating forever. All of you have made it more than clear that there are thousands of people out there who feel the same way that I do. It's a game that reinvigorated my love for this medium, one that's given me hope that I can always find more to love about video games. Never have I been more excited to witness the development of a series than I am right now. And it's all thanks to this beautiful game that has an iron grip on my heart, and I hope it never weakens. As I said previously, thank you, Monolith Soft, for making Xenoblade Chronicles 2 because it is a game worth remembering for a moment of eternity.